tonight on the power and danger. Two signs. The power and danger of potential. The power and danger of potential. We're going to use Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 as our um, our point of reference, our, our base Scripture. This is going to be our foundational Scripture for tonight. This is what it says. It says, For we, say, we, that's me. That's me. For we are His, that's God's, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Say, I'm created for good. Amen. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me read that again. This is, this is powerful if we get it tonight. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which, it, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 is speaking to the God-given potential that every person in the world has. Notice that it does not say we are created for His workmanship. In, uh, uh, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared that we should walk in them. But there is one word in there that really sticks out in that Scripture, and it is the word beforehand. Beforehand. What before? Before what? It goes on to tell us before what? Before we walk in it. So there is good works in me. There is a workmanship that I have been created to perform before I ever perform it. So before you ever step into your calling, before you ever step into your purpose, you were created for it before you do it. Amen? Come on, make it, make, y'all following me so far? And, and, and this is just the foundation right here. We're going to build this line on line tonight. Precept on precept tonight. I want to break it down to its lowest common denominator and then we're going to build on it. Amen? So, so you were created... With gifts and talents. Amen. You have a natural gift. You have a natural talent. Amen. That was placed in you from birth. To walk out the purpose you were designed for. If you remember, we're actually, this is a, this is a message that I could not preach. Uh, a matter of fact, and one day you may remember this. When, before I ever started pastoring, we were having prayer meetings in my house. And the Lord gave me a message that I wanted to preach on a youth night when I was youth pastoring. That He would not let me preach. And it was called the dangers of potential. And, and I shared a little bit with it with Aunt Wanda and my wife uh, Destiny at the time. And uh, we all sat around and talked about it. And I wanted to preach it so bad then, but he wouldn't let me. And um, this past week in prayer, I was praying and I was saying, God, what do you want me to preach? And he brought me back to my remembrance on the dangers of potential. So I pulled it back out and I started looking at it and everything. And I said, okay, God, I see, I see what you're doing. And he took me a lot deeper. Uh, this time around through this study than he did the first time, which I'm glad because it's something new for me. It's something new to you guys. Hopefully it'll be fresh bread for you tonight. And But I, I, I thought, you know, why would he not let me preach this all that time before? And it's because I had to teach things to get us ready for this message. And if you remember a while back, I taught, a, I taught and I said in one of my messages a while back, on a Wednesday night, I talked about how everything that God creates, He first has a purpose and a reason to create it. So the world was dark, 
So God said, let there be light. And light has a purpose. What is His purpose? To, to light it up. To get rid of the darkness, right? So when God created man, remember I took you to Genesis chapter 1 on the sixth day where He's given man all the, all the things He's going to do. I want you to have dominion over the earth. I want you to subdue the earth. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to do all these things. And then in Genesis chapter 2, He creates man and breathes into him. But first, He gave man purpose because God does not create anything without purpose. Amen? So the reason that we are here the reason that you are here and the reason that I am here is because there is something that this world needs that God created us to fulfill the need. Amen? Y'all ready to go deeper? <clears throat> when, I was, when I was young, I had a very bad anger problem. You talk to uh, people, some people now, they'll tell you, I still got an anger problem. But when I was young, it was real bad. I, had a, I was hot-headed. I had a bad temper. I was ready to fight at the drop of the hat, and I would drop the hat. The dangers of that is I was no good at fighting. I, I, I loved to fight, but I wasn't no good at it. <laughs> Amen? So, so I, I, learned, I, I learned real quick in life how to total butt whooping. <laughs> but I was angry all the time. And, I, and people would ask me, why are you so angry? What is what is going wrong in your life that is making you have such a rage and such an anger on the inside of you? And I would blame it on this, or I would blame it on that. I would always try to find, man, I feel the power of God in this. I would always try to find an outside source to blame my anger or my frustration or my stress on. But what I learned through the Word of God and what I learned through prayer is that my problem was not anything on the outside. My problem has everything to do with what was going on on the inside. The fact of the matter was I was frustrated because I did not know who I was. I was frustrated because I did not understand my purpose. I was frustrated and angry because I could not, I did not know where I came from or where I was going. And it made me angry, and it made me ill, and it made me frustrated. But the more that I would press into God through prayer and through the Word, I would begin, I began to unlock my purpose. And I began to unlock my potential. And the little by little, as I began to unlock those things, God began to open me up so that I could see where the real problem lies so that I could deal with it. Amen? Amen. But the only way that I was able to get from this super angry, super frustrated person all the time, I had, I had only one emotion and it was anger. It's the only emotion I had. And now, if you get around me long enough, you'll come to realize I'm pretty mellow. It, ta it takes a pretty good bit of stuff to get me routed up. If I'm mad, it has, it has accumulated over time to get me to the place I'm in. But how was I able to go from such an angry person to a mellow person? It was I started to unlock my purpose. I started to learn who I was. And I started to realize an angry person will not fulfill the purpose that God... Come on, somebody. An angry person ain't going to get me to where I want to be in my life, in my marriage, in my job, or in my ministry. That my attitude is going to have to line up with the purpose that God has placed on my life. How many of you know won't nobody attend a church that's got an angry pastor? Ain't nobody going to church with a pastor that is frustrated and stressed out all the time. They're not going to do it. You have to learn to roll with the punches. And at that time in my life, I was not able to. But as I unlocked my purpose and I began to see where my strengths and my weaknesses were, I was able to line my attitude up with it. Amen? Can I go deeper? There are five questions. Five. These are the five Tough questions every person has to ask themselves. I don't care, sinner and saint alike have to ask themselves these five questions. If I'm boring you right now, hang on, I'm just building a foundation. There is five 
tough questions. Say, these are tough questions. Five tough questions everybody has to ask themselves. And if we was to take a poll, every person in here would, would say, at some point in time in your life, you have asked yourself these questions. Even if you don't think you have, you have subconsciously pondered on these five questions. Are you ready? Number one tough question that you must ask yourself is this. Who am I? Who am I? Because if I do not know who I am, nothing else makes sense. Come on. If I was to ask, if I was to go and just point somebody out and say, who are you? You may tell you what they, they don't tell you who they are. They tell you what they do. Come on. I say, who, who, who are you? Well, I'm a, I'm a mama. Who are you? I'm a mama. I'm a grandmother. And well, no, 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 no. I don't want to know who you, what you do. I want to know who you are. Well, well I work for autos. I don't want to know what you do. I want to know who you are. Well, I'm, I'm a mother. No, I don't want to know. See, come on. And, and, and when we go around the room, if somebody comes to me and says, who are you? I say, I'm Justin. I don't want to know your name. I want to know who you are. Well, I'm a pastor. No, I don't want to know what you do. You see, it's a tougher question than what... Come on now. Yeah. Stick with me. When, when somebody asks you who you are, do you give them your function? Or can, are you able to look deep down inside of you and say, this is who I am. I am a person of order. I am a person that believes in order and authority. And I believe in honor. I am a person that stands for what is right and not... Come on. I, am I that person? Who am I? I don't want to know what your function is and what you do for a living or who you are to someone else. I want to know who you are. Yeah. Because the moment that we find out who we are, we are able to answer the other four questions. And question number one is who am I? But question number two is where am I from? Come on. Because now that I know who I am, the second question I must ask is where do I come from? Because the place that I originate from dictates where I'm going. Come on now. Oh, this is good stuff, right? Where do I come from? You say, well, I came from my mama. Are you sure? Because last time I checked, your daddy carried you around first. Come on now. I used to pick at Destiny. I, I told her I wanted to name. I, I was. I ain't even going to lie to y'all. I wasn't joking. I was for real. I wanted to name Lane Espen. What? ESPN. <laughs> because I had it in my mind when that joker gets old enough to get a phone. His ringtone on my phone is going to be da 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 da. Y'all know the Sports Center. <laughs> I was going to name him Espen. Come on. I had big dreams. I said, how cool would it be if Lane grows up, becomes very athletic, and he plays on the station that his name is? That would just be awesome to me. But I'm a, I'm a sports head, so I thought that was super cool. Come on. And Destiny informed me when I told her that I wanted to name him this, that she carried him for nine months. And nothing that she carried for nine months in her womb was going to come out and be named Espen. Wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Amen. So I turned around and informed her, you carried him for nine months, I carried him for 18 years. <laughs> and then she informed me that when you got rid of him, it was fun. When I got rid of him, I felt like I was going to die. Come on. Amen. So the question still remains. Where do you come from? Come on. You start off in your daddy. You go to your mama. Come on. If I ask you, where, where do you come from? You're going to say, I come from Chilton County. I come from Shelby County. I'm from, I'm from Georgia, but, but I moved here. Come on, where do you come from? I don't want to know what city you come from. I want to know where do you come from? What do you believe? Where is the origin of your life? Where did it begin? Because I don't know about everybody in here, but I know that I originated from a thought my God had. My God had a thought of a purpose, and He found me and said, I know He's unworthy. Where did you come from? 
I come from. The third toughest question that everybody has to ask is, why did I come here? Why did I come here? See, now we're moving into purpose. It goes beyond who I am. It goes beyond where I come from. Why am I here right now? Why am I in this place? Come on. You, you ain't even got to think just naturally. You can get really spiritual with this question because it goes beyond why am I here at this church right now. It goes beyond that. Why am I in the season that I'm in? Why am I in the test that I'm in? Why am I in this trial that I am? Because I'm not in this test just for the devil to beat up on me and for me to get weak. I'm in this test because I'm here to learn something. I'm here to gain my knowledge about something. I'm here to grow for grow in wisdom and gain something from this test. Why am I here? Why am I in this dry season? Why am I in this season of revival? Why am I here? Who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? Number four, what is my ability? Or you could word it like this. What can I do? Come on. Alright. So we answer who I am. I'm a child of God. We answer number two, where do I come from? I come from God. <laughs> I come from my Father in whom I am a child of. Come on. Number three, why am I here? Once I find out why I'm here, I have to find out what I can do where I'm at. Come on. If I'm here to set the captive free, what is the ability that my God has placed inside of me that makes it to where I can fulfill the purpose of why I'm here? Y'all following me? This is getting deep, ain't it? Am I making y'all think yet? Number five is my favorite question. And, and, and it's not the most important question, but after you've answered all four of the other questions, it becomes the most important question. Because it dictates everything you do right now. And it's this. Number five question everybody's got to ask is this. Where am I going? If I know who I am, and I know where I come from, and I know why I'm here, and I know the abilities that I have, number five becomes my most important question. Where am I going? Because my destination that I'm trying to reach dictates my attitude of where I'm at. Come on. You can't go to a place of peace and have an attitude of chaos. Come on. What you trying to do in this season? I'm trying to grow in God. Why are you sitting in that dead church? Because if the place that you are trying to reach is a place of growth, why are you at staying in an environment where everything's done? Yeah, come on now. Come on. Come on. It's a tough question. It's a tough question that we have to ask. We, we say we want to soar with the eagles, but we're hanging out with chickens. Come on. I can't. I, I, look, I, we was talking about it. Me and Randy was talking about it today at the house. Uh, we were talking about how, um, how people in sports, a lot of people in sports, especially football, they have what we call a dog mentality. They just have that dog eat dog mentality. And we were talking about how a lot of people, they don't know how to turn that off. But if you watch them, the company they keep is dogs. Come on. Hungry people find the hungry people. Uh, the truest thing my grandmama ever taught me is birds of a feather flock together. If you, I'm telling you, you want to know who somebody is in the church? Watch and see who they go to the cafe with. If they go into the, the cafe with the wolves, chances are they're a wolf. If they go into the cafe with the liars, chances are they're a liar. You watch what group they get into. The hungry people find hungry people. And the satisfied complaint. Come on. Amen. Where I'm going dictates everything that I'm doing right now. Amen. 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 You were created for a purpose. If, if nothing else, if, if nothing else shows you that, those five questions that everybody, sinner and saint alike, 
ask themselves, it proves one thing. You were created with purpose. Because if, if, if we are to believe that we were created with no purpose, these questions do not matter. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter the abilities I have. It doesn't matter where I came from or where I'm trying to go. Nothing matters if there is no purpose. So how can someone that even that even though they believe that they're an atheist, they will ask themselves these five questions and believe they were created purposeless? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Why ask the questions? Right? Why is suicide and death so devastating yeah. if there is no purpose? Yeah. Man. Biggest lie the devil ever told anybody is you was a mistake. Come on. Think, think about this. When a man and a woman have relations, come on, when they know one another, biblically speaking, at the end of that time, the man releases his seed. Come on, I'm trying to stay spiritual. Y'all help me. <laughs> he releases his seed. In that seed are believed to be 600 billion seedlings. And you, come on, one out of 599 billion, one made it to the egg and it was you. If you don't ever win nothing else, you want to race. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Tell me a story won't nobody believe. That's true. Here's one. My mom and my dad signed me up for a race that I did not ask for them to. That I showed up to the race. There was 600 billion there. I am not athletic, but I'm here to tell you I won. Come on. That's an unbelievable story. Nobody would believe that as even though you are you could be super athletic, you show up to a race with 600 billion and we are led to believe that you outran them all. Nobody would believe that story, but here is the truth. It happened. And if it happened and it's unbelievable, that means it took a God that is unbelievable. That is, come on now, that He purposed you to be here. He purposed for you to be here. Man. You ain't a mistake. You got a purpose. That's a good story. You were born to do something that this world needs. Amen. The world has a need. You were placed here to fulfill the need. That is why until you find your purpose, you can never maximize your potential. Until you find out what your purpose is, you can never maximize your potential. Your potential can never be reached. Amen? Come on now. But on the flip side of this, we ain't even reached to the potential part. We're just still talking about why we need potential. Purpose. On the flip side of this, when a person finds their purpose, they're unstoppable. Why? Because it's like a puzzle piece. You are the missing puzzle piece to the puzzle. And the only person that fits in that spot is you. Come on. He say, "Well, I believe I believe God finds somebody else." Let me let me show you. Let me show you biblically. I'll prove it to you biblically. God told Elisha to go kill Jezebel. And he didn't. And what it would have took Elijah to do, one person, wounds up taking two men to kill Jezebel. Why? Because Elijah had the potential. And the potential that that one person had to accomplish the purpose, the only way that it could be done is if two men, come on, came together to accomplish the goal it could have took one man to do. 
When you discover your purpose, you're unstoppable. I want you to say this. I want you to just lift your hands and receive it. Say, this is the year. I discover my purpose. Say this. Say, this is what God gave me to, for us to do. Say, this is the year, this is the year I, break out. I break out. Receive it. Give Him praise. Come on. Can I go deeper? We're about to get into the meat of this thing. <coughs> I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer it in your mind. What is the wealthiest spot in the entire earth? Just think. Is it the Caribbean? Is it Hawaii? Is it California? Is it Donald Trump? Is it Donald Trump's house? What is the wealthiest spot on the entire earth? Give you a few seconds just to think. Let me tell you what the wealthiest place in the world is. The cemetery. The cemetery. Let me tell you why. The cemetery or a graveyard is the most wealthiest place in the world. If that is what I believe, then here is the question I must answer. What's its wealth? Right? What's its wealth? It is the wealthiest place in the world because it has the one thing that every person here is trying to discover. Potential. Potential is a powerful thing if we ever tap into it. But it is the most dangerous thing because millions upon millions upon millions die Every day, never unlocking their potential. It's the wealthiest place on earth. Think about this. In the graveyard, there are books that have never been written. There are songs. Man, come on, let's make you think. There is songs that will never be sung. There are people laying in that graveyard that had the potential to write some of the most powerful songs ever written and never tapped into the potential that God laid on their life and the grave stole their potential. So this is the next thing we're going to declare over our life. Come on, that's about a de declaration. The grave won't steal my potential. I'm going to find the potential that God has placed in my life. I'm going to tap into it. And I'm going to unlock it. And the grave will not steal my potential. If I have the potential to reach 3,000 people and bring them into the kingdom, I will fulfill it by the grace and mercy of my God. The grave won't steal my potential. Amen? When we die, we should die empty. Come on. We should die empty. Death is not a bad thing. Death is a good thing because to die means to be absent from the body. And what does 2 Corinthians tell us? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 12, I believe it is. He says, for we have a hope, yes, a confidence even, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So death is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Amen? But when we die, when we reach that point, I hope every single one of us go in the rapture. But if it is God's will for us to die, we should die empty. Let me prove it to you. Somebody say prove it. When Jesus hung on the cross, what did He say? It is finished. It is complete. It is finito. It is done. I have accomplished the work that I have set out to do. I have maximized my potential. And my potential that I came into this earth with was to save the whole world. And on this tree, by the shedding of my 
my blood, I have done so. It is done. Our Savior died empty. You say, yeah, but that was Jesus. Okay, 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to start reading in verse 5. What you, what you have right here in 2 Timothy chapter 4 is Paul's final declaration. Paul's laying on his deathbed. And this is the last words we get from Paul in his final letter. 2 Timothy chapter 4 starting with verse 5. Listen to what it says. It says... But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Come on. Did he say, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist? Did he say, preachers, do the work of an evangelist? You know who he's writing to? The church. He's telling everybody, you are to do the work of an evangelist. Every single person in this room should evangelize. Fulfill your ministry. Now watch this. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. What do you say? I'm being emptied. I'm being, man, think about a, 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 a washcloth that's full of water and it's being wrung out till it's dry. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I am being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. He's saying the last few drops are being wrung out of me and it is almost time for me to go. Yeah. Watch what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge will give me on that day. And not to me only but also to all who have loved he is appearing. What did he say? He say, "I'm." Paul said, "I'm here on my deathbed, and I have gained revelation of what the rapture is going to be like. And I believed until my last breath that I was going to go in the rapture. But now I am here on my deathbed. But I'm not dying full. I've done everything that I was able to do. I maximized my potential. I was poured out to the last drop." And I have up until my last breath. And I am dying empty. Come on. Come on. What greater joy than to know I am leaving this earth to be reunited with my Savior. And when I stand before Him, I get to decree and declare, I have accomplished everything you sent me there to do. Come on. How awesome would that be to say, God, you sent me to the sent me to that earth with a purpose, and I completed the work. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on. When Jesus says, Enter in, my good and faithful servant, you know what he's saying? Mission complete. How I long to hear the words of my of my general. Come on, of my captain of this army of heaven that I belong to the, the, the king of the kingdom to look me eyeball and eyeball and say good job Justin mission complete you have fulfilled the purpose you emptied out every drop that I gave in you I, you left everything out there and you did it for me come on in yeah. Hallelujah. ultimate reward yeah. that's why those words are going to be so great for us to hear. That's why the crown that He gives us as our reward, you find us in Revelations taking them off and giving them back to Him. Because those words are enough. I don't need a crown. I just want to hear my King say, Mission accomplished. Man. Man. So make a good funeral message. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a priest set at the next funeral. Mission complete. Yeah. The graveyard is wealthy because it's full of potential. It's full of people that never found purpose and never maximized their potential. Man. 
The power of potential is that it will take you from nowhere and put you somewhere. Damn. The power of potential is it will take you nowhere and put you somewhere. I don't know. Look at Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, before you were ever born, I called you and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Yeah. Come on. When you, by the time you were birthed, I had already ordained you. What did Jeremiah say? Jeremiah said, but Lord, I'm just a youth. You know what he was saying? God, I don't see the potential. Come on. I don't see the potential. And he said, Never let those words leave your lips again. Come on. He said, just say what I tell you to say. Go where I tell you to go and do what I tell you to do. And if you do these things, Jeremiah, I will put you before kings. Come on. He took Jeremiah from a place of seeing no potential in his life and said, if you will maximize your potential like I have like I have spoken to your life, I'll, I'll take you somewhere. You feel like a nobody right now, but I'll have you standing in royal places. Come on. Potential will take you from nowhere and put you somewhere. Can I go further? This is a hard one to swallow. Y'all ready? You got your steel toe boots on? Because I'm going to stomp on some toes right here. I promise I done stepped on mine first. <laughs> Listen to this. And hear me very clear because this, this about knocked the wind out of me in prayer when, it, when he gave me this. God is not impressed by what you've done. That's hard. That's, that's tough. Can I go further? How many of you have heard us talk about Brownsville? Some of you have experienced Brownsville. Yeah. Some of you experienced it. Yeah. Brownsville did not impress God. No. Nope. That's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow. Because the things that impress us. Come on. Yeah. Those, those messages that I preached that I just thought was so awesome. Right. It didn't impress Him. Right. Come on. God is not impressed by what you've done. That is why we should always ask Him what's next. That's right. What impresses God is not what you've done. It is your desire to see what you can do. Right. Your hunger for the next thing. That impresses God. God says, man, I just... I just I, Peter, you just got out of the upper room and just preached a five-minute message and 3,000 people got saved and you know that I'm not impressed by it and you said, God, where do we go from here? That impresses me. That impresses me. That even though this is something so amazing and so astonishing because I'm such a big and mighty God, you are still desiring for the next level of anointing. You're still seeking the next level of glory. You're still seeking a next move of my presence. Yes. That impresses me. Hallelujah. That impresses me. God is so creative that it is impossible. And this is, I'm telling you, this right here is probably the most powerful revelation that I can give us tonight is this little section right here. God is so creative it is impossible for Him to repeat Himself. He can't do the same thing twice. Because every time He tries to do something again, it's greater. That's right. Amen. <laughs> I'm not done with that. Let's, let's, let's dive into that a little further. Y'all want to? The thing that we must realize is that potential is never finished. Amen? Yeah. You're never done maximizing your potential. You never, you're never done until you die. Yeah. Potential for growth is always there. Amen? Yeah. I'm going to give you 
you a word that everybody in here has probably heard. And it's this word, omni. O-M-N-I. Omni. What does omni mean? What does it mean? It means all. Everything. Right? Let me give you another word. Potent. What does potent mean? P-O-T-E-N-T. Yes, I had to look at my notes. Leave me alone. Potent. Strong. It means powerful. About to go somewhere right here. It means powerful. If you put omni and potent together, it gives you a new word called omnipotent or omnipotent. Omnipotent. There is only one being in which that name belongs to. Come on. It is the creator of the universe. It is God Almighty. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. Well, guess what potent is? Potent is the root word for potential. So when you say God is omnipotent, it doesn't just mean that He is all powerful, but it means He is all potential. Oh, man. He is all potential. Everything that can be done, He has the potential to do it. My God, I'm about to go somewhere. God created everything in this world by speaking. Grasp this. It's hard for us to grasp it. It's hard for me. To, I gotta sit down. It's hard for me to grasp this. Because follow me. The first thing God did before, what does the Bible say? Before anything was, I am. That what he means when he says that is before there was anything on this earth, I was here. So the first thing I did was open up my mouth. And speak the earth into existence. But I'm omnipotent. And I have all potential. And I'm so creative that everything I do is greater than the first thing. So God spoke the whole world to existence. And then created man. And told man everything that you see. Write this down. Everything that you see I created with words. And since I am omnipotent and I'm all powerful and I have all potential, sit back. If you think that's awesome, watch what I do next. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The number one thing that even science is trying to figure out is how everything got here. Yeah. And he created it with a word. And he said, I'm full of potential, so what I do next will be greater than me speaking everything into existence. Mind blowing. My God. I can't get over that. If God is full of potential, then that means everything that He does is to outdo what He did. And we sit around, me included, I'm not, I'm not throwing, I'm preaching to me, me included, want him, wants him to move like he did last time. Come on. Come on. Great. We sit around and we talk about what he did and what he done, and he's all potential. He says, I, I believe in this season that we're in is exactly what Brother Rusty's saying. I'm not going to sit around and discuss what he did. I'm going to look forward to what he is about to do. Because he is going to outdo himself. Yes. Hallelujah. 
Come on. Some of man, I'm preaching to myself. If I ain't preaching to nobody else, I'm preaching to myself. I turned in a 2018 Hyundai Santa Fe with 80,000 miles, 88,000 miles in a blew up motor. And I thought that was a blessing when I got it. And he said, watch what I do in this next scene. I'm going to give you something nicer. I'm going to give you something better. Don't worry about what the payment is. Just step into this next scene that I've got for you and trust me because what I'm about to do is going to outdo everything I've ever done. I'm not looking for a move like Brown's for. I'm looking for a move that's greater than Brown. I promise you this. John Kilpatrick ain't looking for a move like Brown's for. He was there and experienced it. He's looking for something bigger, something better. And God am I. Come on. I'm all potential. Think about the greatest season in your life. Spiritually speaking. The greatest season in your life where it just seemed like the windows of heaven was opened up and he just kept pouring and kept pouring. The next season you find yourself in is going to be greater than that season. Why? Because we serve a God full of potential. We expect him to save our house. Why stop there with a God full of potential? You say in your prayer time, God, you've saved them before. And you'll save them again. But God said, I'm full of potential. I'll do more than save them. I'll sink the them. I'll fill them with the Holy Ghost. I'll send them out into the field to minister my gospel. I'm omnipotent.
<laughs> Come on, somebody. But I was showing him my car. And he looked over there in my car. Man, I feel this. He looked over there in my car. And he seen my 45 tucked in over there on the passenger seat. Come on. I got my piece of steel riding shotgun. Amen. I got that 45 tucked in over there on the on the passenger side, right? And he sees it. He said, oh, man, you got your hammer over there. I said, yes, sir. You better believe it. I don't go nowhere with it. Because I know the world is full of potential to be harmful and to be deadly. So I want to have my weapon with me at all times. I know every place I go into has the potential to be a demonic place, to be full of spirits, to be full of principality. So I don't walk out of the house unless I got on my helmet of salvation, my breastplate of righteousness, my belt of truth. I don't step outside my house unless my feet are prepared, shod with the preparation of the gospel, unless I got my shield of faith and my sword of the spirit. You ain't going to find me weapon. Potential. Come on. Come on. I'm loaded with potential. My God. I can't get away from that. I am loaded with potential. I'm just got to find out how. I got to find out how to unleash and maximize the potential that I have. Because potential is powerful. And potential is good. But potential is dangerous if it's never unlocked. I got another scripture. Calm down. Be good. Genesis. Can y'all go with me to Genesis real quick? I want to show y'all one more thing. And I'm going to be done. Man. Watch this. I want to try and tie a bow on this message tonight. Genesis 17. Has this been good? What's going on right here is Abraham is about to receive a promise from God. But I want us to pay close attention to how God addresses Abraham. (coughs) Genesis 17, start with verse 1. When Abram, this is before he changed his name, for those of you that don't know, before Abraham was Abraham, there was no H. He was Abram. Okay? And Sarah was Sarai. When Abram was 99 years old, that's old. Come on. 99. And we know the covenant he makes with Abraham. I'm about to give you a son. Some The Bible calls it a blessing. I call it a curse. Come on. 99 years old. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, listen to the first words that comes out of his mouth. I am Almighty God. Thank you. Thank you. I was looking for one about there, there wasn't none. And she came out with a bottle. You gotta know what's that. You got you got King James? You got King James version? Does it say I am Elohim, God Almighty? Thank you. I am the Almighty God. I am the Almighty God. New Living Translation. Says it like this. I am Elohim. The Almighty God. I love love that right there. How it. Man. You know. I am Elohim. You know what Elohim means? The creator of the world. What he was saying right there is Abram. You see everything you see. I did that. Come on. Don't get it twisted. Yeah. A monkey didn't do it. Right. Right. A gas didn't do it. Right. Alien 
friends didn't do it, I did. And then he goes on to say, the Almighty God. Do you know what that word right there, Almighty, means? Omnipotent. Omnipotent. He said, Abram, before I tell you anything else, I want to get one thing straight. I'm full of potential. <laughs> Gosh. Man. You may tell you what, what, what gets me so excited about that. He addressed himself to me the very first time the same way. Guess what else? Every person sitting in here, he addressed himself just like that to you the very first time. You know how? Because you thought you were unsavable. Yeah. Yeah. And when he drew you to the altar, come on. And when He drew you to the place of salvation, when He sent Holy Spirit on you, come on. Because no man comes to salvation unless the Spirit draws him. Come on. The Spirit of God's got to draw him. When He done that, He said, you thought you was unsafe. You thought you was unreachable. But I'm full of potential. You don't know what you're getting with me. Because I took you from a place that you never thought you would get out of. Close the Bible right there. <sighs> My God. He said, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the full of potential God. The all-powerful, the almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Let me tell you a secret. He's blameless. Come on. How can I be blameless when I'm human? I can't. The by God, you said that we all fall short. You said Him without sin cast the first stone. You said no man is good no, not one. So how in the world can I be blameless? You know what he says? He says, my answer to that question is in my first statement. I'm full of potential. We, you mean, I'm, about to, I'm about to help your Christian walk so much. <laughs> Christian living ain't about you. That's where we struggle. That's where we fall. We get so focused on Christian living and we try to make it all about us. I gotta read more. I gotta pray more. I gotta fast more. I gotta do this more. I gotta do that more. I gotta be a better witness. I gotta put this down. I gotta pick this up. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. Paul said, I'm not tied to the law any longer. I cannot achieve salvation through my righteous work lest any man should boast. But it is by His grace, it is by His blood, it is by His mercy that we all reach the place of righteousness. Come on. He said, He 
till you were 40. 30. Some of you waited a long time. It took you 30 years to get that dirty. And most preachers will tell you that the moment you prayed that prayer, come on, the moment you prayed that prayer, you became blameless. I want to tell you that's wrong. <laughs> you may tell you when you became blameless. At the moment you made up in your heart, you was about to say that prayer. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. My mouth is confessing what my heart has already experienced. You say, I don't believe that. The Bible says the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When I ask God to come into my life, my heart had already experienced His grace, His love, and His mercy. My mouth was declaring what my heart just experienced. My God. As a... Huh? Yeah. Blameless and sincere. Blameless and sincere. Come on. It's when you're sincere before God. That's what makes you blameless. Come on. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The moment I believed in my heart that he was going to save me, I was saved. The reason I proclaim it out of my mouth is to let everybody else know what he already did. Yeah. Amen. Somebody going to send me a book on their doctrine. I can feel it. I can feel it. <laughs> let me read on. <laughs> I want to I wanna try and get to verse 2. I really do. <laughs> when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless and sincere, the King James says. And I will make my covenant between me and I will make a, my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Now Maybe, maybe it's just something in the food or the water today. Maybe Abram, can I get real and raw with you? Maybe Abram discovered the little blue pill before it was a thing. <laughs> Because last time I checked, 99 year olds are not active. Not that you know of. That I know of. I'm just being real. Hey. Yeah. Being real. That's why we send the kids to the back on Wednesday so we can get real. Amen. Most 99 year olds I know ain't sowing seed. <laughs> being honest. Come on. They ain't so and see. And you just told Abram, at 99 years old, wasn't his wife 90? She's, she, she's younger, but she's still in her 90s. Not only is she 90, but she's barren. Come on. She's been told she can't have children. And he says, I'm going to take a 99 year old that is supposed to be out of sea and put him with a woman that is supposed to be barren. So that means not only am I seedless, but I've got bad ground. <laughs> Come on. And when. Come on, he's lived 99 years. I don't know how long he was with Sarah, but I'm sure it was for a long time. And it, <laughs> he done been with this woman all this time, sowing all this seed, and the ground's been bad for this long. Come on now. And you taking somebody with no seed, and no ground.
and said, I'm going to multiply you. Sarah, I'm not just going to multiply you. I'm going to multiply you exceedingly. My favorite scripture. Come on. For he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Man. He says, I'm going to multiply you exceedingly. I'm going to give you a son. Come on, if you keep reading right there in Genesis 17, when he says exceedingly, he means exceedingly. He tells Abram, he says, can you count the stars? Come on. How about the sand, Abram, in this desert you're standing in? Can you count the speckles of sand? Because that is going to be how much I multiply you by. I ain't got no seed. I ain't got no grain. But I'm going to be multiplied. How can this be? It can be not because of you. But because I'm full of potential. And when you stand blameless before me. I will take you from something you can't even imagine. Something that when, when your wife hears about this, she's going to laugh in your face. Come on. <laughs> They're going to laugh at you. They're going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you. Come on, somebody. But they do not understand that the God I have is full of potential and He has placed that potential inside of me. My God. Hallelujah. Listen to this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to end right here, okay? Closing the Bible to remind me. Let me tell you something about potential. Lord gave me eight things potential is. Can I share them with you and then I'll be done? Potential is dormant ability. Once you do something, it's no longer potential. It's an accomplishment. So if God has done everything we've experienced and He says, I'm full of potential, that means there is abilities that He has we have not seen. Paul said it best. He said, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has prepared for those that love Him. And then He said, but the Spirit Revealed it to me. <laughs> I have a revelation. Yeah, you know what I think the revelation was? I think it's this revelation right here. It's greater. I haven't seen it. I haven't heard it. It ain't even came into my heart yet. But I know it's full of potential. And it's going to blow my mind. Whatever it is. It's dormant ability. It is unstoppable. Let me say it this way. It is untapped power. Potential is power and ability you have not yet experienced. This is something we've got. Come on. Potential is hidden strength. How mad... Let me go to number four and then I'll say this. Potential is reserved energy. You know what reserved energy is? The battery in your car. It's reserved energy. Come on. 
So that means it has energy that is stored up for one purpose. To start your engine. If everything is operating correctly, your alternator's good and all that, correct me if I'm wrong, that battery starts the car and then stores energy. For the next time it is called on to start the car. How mad would you be to know? Come on. I'm about to, I'm about to make you mad at yourself. Because when the Lord showed me this, I was mad at myself. You hear me? I was ticked at Justin. So I'm about to make you ticked at you. If I have to go through it, so do you. How mad would it make you to know that you went through a season that you felt like you had no strength and no energy just to come to find out there was hidden strength and reserved energy in you that you have not yet discovered. Come on. And one as mad as fire at herself right now. Let me tell you what. Because just a few nights ago, she broke down in Whataburger. Come on. Because she was going through a time. And I'm not pointing her out to throw rocks at her. I'm giving you an example because I know she don't care. Because if you was in her shoes, you'd done the same thing. Amen? Yeah. Broke down. Just to be told, there is hidden strength and reserved energy inside of her that she knows nothing about. You know why? Because she hasn't been placed, she hasn't been placed in the right environment for her to realize and tap into it. And the very thing that she thought would be the end of it all was only a test to show her I have more energy and strength than what I thought I had. People quote that scripture all the time, and I'm one of them. Lord won't put more on us than we'll bear. That's true. The Bible says it. Come on. The idea of it is there. But here's the fact. We don't know what we can handle. I don't know what I'd do if my wife died. I don't think I could make it. Be careful. He might prove it to you. Come on. Some of you, some of you that's lost lost a spouse know what I'm talking about. I just don't I don't think I can make it if my motor blew up in my car. I ain't got the money, I ain't got I ain't got the way, I don't know what I would do. I would be the end of it all. Come on. <laughs> Let me show you just how strong you are. Come on, somebody. Here's the thing. He said, I'll never put more on you than you can bear. But he also turns around in another scripture and he says, when it feels like you can't take no more Throw it on me Some of you are going through things And total burdens You are not meant to carry It's time to throw it off on him That has all potential Thank you Jesus Hallelujah You know what else Number five Potential Is a kept Capacity I gotta break this one down. A kept capacity. Let me tell you what's sad. There are pastors out there that do not want to grow beyond a certain number. I said. I said. And you know what it is? It is a lack of confidence within them. Come on. Because the 60 they got is stressing him to the max. And he don't think he can take no more. So he don't want to get beyond 60. He's not willing to maximize his potential. 
So he does not keep moving to what is next because what is next might bring in more. Come on. Because everything that God does, it increases everything around it. So they put a lid. Here's what's sad. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not throwing stones. Because the fact of the matter is, if I don't stay prayed up, I will fall into the same trap. Oh, yeah. You hear me? Paul said it this way. Paul said, don't poke fun at them for falling into that temptation. Lest you be tried by the same thing. And you will fall into it. God will make sure that you fall into the same trap as somebody else just because you talked about it. So I'm not poking fun and I'm not throwing stones. I'm telling you, but I'm telling you because it's happening right here. And not only me, but everyone in this field needs to be aware. Due to low self-esteem and no confidence, church leaders put lids on their congregation. Come on. They put lids on them. Amen? You know what a lid does? It only allows a container to hold so much capacity. But the fact is, pastors were never called to be lids. They were called to be coverings. Come on. Come on, man. A covering is like an umbrella. My God, this is good. It's like an umbrella. I'm five nine. 5'10 on a good day. <laughs> How tall are you, Randy? 6'3. Six, three. Six, three. An umbrella will cover me. Come on. Yeah. And guess what? That same umbrella will cover him. It has no restrictions right. on how high Something goes. An umbrella does not restrict the level of growth to the person that it covers. It is there to protect and to cover no matter what altitude they climb to. Come on. That's good stuff. Watch this. Watch this. This is even cooler. Randy. My God, this is good. Oh, yes. Randy, let's say this. Let's say me and Randy's walking through the rain. And we only got one umbrella. Okay? First of all, if it's me and Randy, somebody getting wet. Because we ain't standing that close. But for the sake of the demonstration, let's say we're walking close enough to share this umbrella. Okay? Who's going to hold it? If I hold the umbrella, I'm keeping his knees dry. Come on. Amen? Because I can't reach the altitude that I need to to make sure he's covered. That's why people are leaving churches with the belief that they have outgrew their pastor. Because they have reached a level in which they believe that the pastor can no longer cover them. Come on, somebody. In order for both of us to be covered, he has to hold the umbrella. What happens a lot of times is you have pastors that say, I'll be the umbrella, but this is as high as I'm willing to go. Man. we got to have pastors that are willing to grow more, come on, than everybody around them. The pastor needs to be the hungriest person in the building. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. Amen? If the pastor ain't hungry and he's the one cooking, 
everybody's getting fed. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, come on. If we all got to eat when he gets hungry, yeah. and he ain't never hungry, come on, this is something an evangelist should tell you. Yeah. A pastor shouldn't be telling you this. We're exposing the lies of the enemy tonight. And I'm telling somebody, if you think you can out-eat me, come on and try it. Because I'm hungry for a move. I want it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I want to wake up and pray. I want to go to sleep speaking in tongues. And I want to dream dreams and see vision. I'm not satisfied. the hungriest person in the building. That's what stresses pastors out. Yeah. Because they want everybody to match their intensity. Yeah. They want everybody to match their hunger. Yeah. But they need to realize, man, I should be preaching this at a leadership conference. Yeah. They need to realize that they have to be more intense. Yeah. They have to be more passionate. They have to be more hungry so that everybody else can follow their My gosh, number six. <laughs> Got three more. Six, seven, and eight. Potential is unused success. Unused success. Man, to think the graveyard is you <coughs> is full of unused success. Number seven, potential is unused talent. Unused talent. I told you about books that were never written, songs that were never sung. Here's the thing. Here's the vision for our church. We will sing songs that other people have written, but we will write songs no one has ever heard. Come on. Amen. Amen. We've done it. Yep. We've done it. Yep. Come on. We will write songs no one's ever heard. That's right. Because we're going to maximize our potential. Yep. Let me tell you what I am. I work in the gift of apostleship. I don't claim to be an apostle, but that is the gift I believe that the Lord's placed on my life. And the reason I believe that is because apostles are all about Three things. Number one, they're all about order. Come on. They put stuff in order. Number two, they plant churches. And number three, they resurrect churches. Come on. That's what they do. You say, I don't know about that. Paul didn't just start churches, but he started a church left and went and started another church and when that church started dying he went back and he said let's get this thing back going back alive again he don't just start churches he resurrects churches I'm going to say this and I'm going to say it one time and I don't never say this because this is something I try to keep behind the scenes and this is something that I just try to allow God to work out but do not be surprised when God sends us into a place to bring a church back to life. He's not going to sit around and watch people die and watch people go by the wayside. But I have been sent with a purpose to bring the church back to life. He said, speak to those bones and tell the breath of God to enter into them. And he seen them rise up and become an exceedingly great army. God, I will be your Ezekiel and I will go where you tell me to go. I will say what you tell me to say. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come alive, some of Come on, y'all are with me. Say, come alive, church. Come alive, church. Bring the breath of God and come back to life. Yes, hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Oh, 
I can't get away. Uh, I can't get away. I have been called with a purpose. Uh, can I just preach to myself for a minute? Uh, I have been called with a purpose. Uh, I am not just marching on my orders uh, and my orders alone. Uh, it doesn't matter who it makes mad. Uh, it doesn't matter who wants to stay behind. Uh, it doesn't matter who wants to go with us. Uh, David said, can I go up and get them? Uh, God said, go. Uh, he said, will you deliver them into my hand? Uh, he said, I will deliver them. Uh, but there was a few men uh, that said, we don't want to go. Uh, we want to stay right here. Uh, but David said, okay, stay. But God has told me to go And I'm going to go And I'm going to bring back What the devil tried to steal I'm going to bring them to life This place that the enemy Thought it was going to burn down The wicked may be in camp But I decree and I declare Loose them and let them go Oh, can I go there? Oh, I don't know why I'm feeling this tonight. I ain't never felt like speaking this before. But I'm going to speak it right now. Before any church could ever get planted. Before any church could ever get resurrected. There was scales that had to fall off eyes. God said, I put scales on your eyes, Paul. But you're going into a city. And you're going to meet a man by the name of Ananias. And when he lays his hands on you... The scales will fall off. I decree and I declare. Scales fall off the eyes. Let them see the truth. Let them believe the truth. Let God's word be accomplished. I will see the miracles. I will see the dreams come to pass. I will see the demons come to pass. The well will not run dry. I will take my shovel and read it the way. God, I'm not going to sit around and watch the potential go to waste. God ain't going to sit around and watch potential go to waste. Number eight. Man, that was for three or four of us. <laughs> Number eight. Potential is all you can do, but you haven't done. Yeah. Come on. Potential is all you can do, but you ain't done it yet. Oh, man. A dream is potential. Come on. Yeah. Sitting in there. I'm going to use Randy again because me and him talk today. You got to be careful around me. You'll turn into a sermon real quick. <laughs> me and Randy sat around and talked for a long time today. My butt's sore because he kicked it pretty good. But it was good conversation, you know. If they're going to beat you down, they might as well conversate with you a little bit. So we talked. We talked about different things. We talked about the upcoming season. And there was one thing he kept reiterating in the conversation. I told you today, I watch people. I listen, bud. I listen, I listen man. I'm listening to every word everybody says because I don't want to miss something. Come on. You, what you call listening, I call discerning. And I'm listening, and one thing he keeps reiterating is this. I know my mistakes, and I know where I need to improve, and I know what I need to work on. Now I've just got to go. Taking what I know, and do what I know I can do. Because I have I've gained a revelation of the potential that I have. Yeah. But I don't want it to stop there. Right. 
I want to maximize the potential. I know what I can do. I just got to go and do what I can do. He talked about how last year he's not, he's not used to the system. I hope this is okay. If it ain't, we'll talk. Blame him. <laughs> he said, Last year I was not familiar with the system. I wasn't familiar with how things would be ran or what I could and could not do. So I, the way that I played was kind of robotic. Yeah. I did exactly what they told me to do. And I allowed them to, basically, putting it in my own words, I allowed them to do the thinking for me. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. <laughs> but now that I know what they want, and I know my abilities. I can mix the two. Yeah. And know what I'm supposed to do. And the outcome that they desire. And I don't necessarily got to do it their way. As long as the end result is the same. Come on. I know my abilities. And I know what their expectations are. So I'm going to go out there and prove what I am able to do. Come on somebody. Yeah. I wish the church would get that revelation and say the end goal is souls and the end goal is heaven and the end goal is getting as many people to heaven as I can possibly get. I don't care what your style of preaching is. I don't care what your style of church is. I don't care how you do it as long as we are getting it done. Come on. Me and Brother Jason Dunn, a perfect example. Our church looks nothing like his church. They shout different. They play different music. The style of preaching is different. But the outcome is the same. Souls are being won. People are being healed. People are being delivered. I don't care what it looks like. I just want to know, are you leading them to Jesus? Well, I like quiet church. That's fine. As long as they're leading people to Jesus. Come on. I don't want to know how many people you got on a Sunday. I want to know how many people got saved on Sunday. Running 300 ain't had a salvation in 30 years. Come on, I'm going to preach anyway. Come on. We might only run 60, but we see seeing people get breakthrough every week. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. People getting breakthrough on Sunday morning. People getting breakthrough on Sunday night. We get into Wednesday night Bible study and people getting breakthrough on Wednesday night. But that ain't enough for us. We get breakthrough on Monday. We get breakthrough on Tuesday. House of the Promise with a Facebook page and Messenger is constantly being blown up with testimony after testimony. Why is that? Because we are hungry to maximize our potential. I don't preach till everybody's in the sanctuary. Praise God. That means I need to hurry up. There's one thing you got to know. That's all eight of them, ain't it? I think so. It says number eight up beside it. There's one thing you got to know about potential. Just by a show of hands. Who wants to maximize their potential? Yes. Says, hey, I want to reach my full yes. potential. Yes. That's 100%, right? Everybody wants to do that. I want to give you a warning. I'm going to leave you with a warning. You know what I'm about to say. Potential is demanding. Yeah. You ain't going to reach your potential without sweat. Right. Come on. That's right. You ain't going to reach your potential without tears. Yeah. You ain't going to reach your potential without blood. Come on. Yeah. Blood 
Sweat, sweat and tears ain't just for the sports world. Nope. It's for the church world. Yes. It's by his blood, by our sweat, and by his and our tears yeah. that we will reach and maximize our potential. Come on. I find it very funny that the so-called curse he put on man is that they would have to work the ground by the sweat of their brow. And then everything related to the kingdom has to do with working the ground. Come everything. He'll give seed to the sower. He, him that puts his hands to the plow and looks back ain't fit for the kingdom. Come on. Everything to do with the kingdom, he relates to the ground. And the very first thing he told man after seeing came is you will work this ground to the sweat of your brow. You know what he was saying? I've given you grace. And I've given you mercy. And I've given you a way of escape. But the kingdom and the purpose that I am putting you on the earth to do will be by the sweat of your brow. That's why he had to decree and declare to us and proclaim to us, do not become weary and well doing. You will reap if you faint not. Come on. Why did he have to tell us that? Because there's going to be some sweat involved. Come on. There's going to be some tough times involved. Do y'all know what a strength test is? Come on, I'm off notes now. I'm just now preaching good. Do y'all know what a strength test is? They test something for strength. You know what they do? They put so much pressure on a thing till it breaks. And they say, yeah, go home and look at your bed. And find that tag that is illegal to remove. So I know all y'all got it still on your mess. Come on. I'm going to go to everybody's house and we're going to have a mattress check. And we're going to have a repentance service for everybody's ripped them off. You say it's a sin. He says, obey the laws of the land. You better not rip that thing off. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's comical. <laughs> Miss Sheila said, I gotta repent and buy a new mattress. <laughs> I'm just joking. But listen, go look at that, go look at that tag. And you know what it says on that tag? Max weight capacity. This is how much weight. This bed can hold without breaking. How did they know? Because they put it through a strength test. And they put weight on top of weight on top of weight until the whole bed just caves in. Breaks. Stop looking at your trial like trouble. And start looking at your trial like a strength test. Come on. Because if we start going through a trial with the with the idea I'm in a strength test, come on. What we gonna do? We're gonna poke that chest out and say, I will not break. I will not bend. Come on. You may put it in biblical terms. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through a street test and they said, King, we will not break. We will not bend. This is what they said. We will not bow. You put as much pressure on us as you want to. You turn the heat up as hot as you want to because my God is full of potential and the fire that you're turning up that is supposed to kill me will only destroy the very thing you designed to hold me. It's not trouble. It's a strength test. And I'm about to just find out not how, not just how strong I am because my trial is not a strength test for me. My trial is a strength and I serve a God that don't break. I serve a God that don't bend. And I serve a God that don't back. I'm not testing me. I'm 
testing God. You say, oh, it says, don't test God. You know what he said? He said, try me. I don't know. Man, this white boy, this white boy was raised gangster. And try me means different, means something different to me than it does to all of them. Randy gonna get me for that after so he's like, why you look at me when you say gangster? Huh? It's the do rag. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> Listen, it means something different to me. Try me to most of you is like the sampler tray <laughs> at Publix. Come on, you know the one that you walk by real quick so they can't get a good look at you just so if you like it, you can walk by a second time? Come on. That's why I don't mess with the one in Publix. I go down to the food court, that teriyaki turkey, or teriyaki chicken. Boy, there's so many people in there, they can't keep up with who got a sample. I'll eat myself full of it. Toothpick after toothpick. Come on. They say, we're going to this store. Where are you going to be at? I'll be in the food court. <laughs> That's what try me means to most of y'all. You know what try me means to me? Try me. Come on. Try me. What that means to me, yeah, if, a, if another guy wants a piece and wants to throw hands, I'll look at him and I'll say, try me. Try me. Come on. I done been in a bunch of fights and been whipped by men much bigger than you. Try me. Come on. Come on. I used to tell them, if you're feeling froggy junk, because I'm going to mess your landing up. <laughs> Told one guy, I said, I'm be on you like white on rice and a paper plate in a snowstorm, baby. You don't want that. <laughs> Try me. So when I read the Bible, the Lord speaks to me like I know. So when I read, try me and see if I'm not good, he's saying, I'm so good, you don't think I can bless you? Try me. You don't think I can help you? Try me. You don't think I can heal you? Try me. You don't think I can deliver you? Try Come on, I'm about to go deep up in this time. You don't think I can save them? Try me. You don't think I can pour out a blessing you can't contain? Try me. You think they're so bound up they can't never get free? Try me. You don't think they're in a place that they can't, that I can't reach them? Try me. I wish you would because I'm going to show you how good I really am. Try me. Try me. I wish you would. Come on. That was always the one to follow. Try me. I wish you would. Come on. Because the only way we're going to maximize our potential is to tap into His. Amen. Stand all over the house. I have took up. I told I was. I said I was almost done at eight oh six. It's eight fifty. I'm a liar. I need to repent. I don't wait fifty two minutes closing. Heard a, I heard a guy say. See, I'm getting started again. I heard a guy say he was in church one time, and you know. The preacher will preach, man, and he'll say, I'm getting ready to close. And he'll get preaching again, and he'll say, I'm getting ready to close. He'll go to preaching a little longer. I'm getting ready to close. That little boy in that church said, my goodness, how many doors does this message got? <laughs> Come on. Come on. I wasn't lying. I was joking. I tricked all y'all. Except Kevin. I'm just playing. Very simple. Who in here is saying, Pastor, I don't just want to maximize my potential, but I need a revelation on my potential. And, and, and before we start jumping, before we raise hands, come down to the altar, any of that, 
This is what you need to know. When you make the statement to God, reveal my potential. Get ready for the strength test. Come on. Come on. Because the way that we find out how strong we are, He uses tests and trials to reveal it to us. That's why every trial we ever go through is always the toughest one. There's not another trial out there that is tougher than the one you're in right now. Come on. And if you'll think back, the last trial you went through, you said the same thing. You said, man, it's the toughest thing I've ever been through in my life. And then the next trial comes and you say, man, it's the toughest thing I've ever been through in my life. Then you make it through that one and five years later you're going through another trial. And you're saying, it's a tough trial I've been through in my life. It's tough. Because it is. It is the toughest thing you've ever been through. Why? Because you have not been tested in that way ever before. It is new. It is new. You say, well, my car broke down last time and I made it through that and my car broke down this time, but it seems tougher. The circumstances are different. The environment is different. And now you've got to take what you learned back there and apply it to this. Come on, man. Come on. You ever heard somebody say, this ain't my first rodeo? Guess what? Different bull, but I'm going to ride it the same way. Come on. You know where you know how I ride that bull? I grab on to what Moses called the horns of the altar. Yeah. That's right. And I pray for the potential in my life to be unlocked. So with that being said, if you say, God. Reveal my potential. And unlock the potential in my life. You just slip up your hands. Hallelujah. Keep them up. Keep them up if that's you. I want everybody to look around for a minute. See the potential. Come on. See the people that are unlocking potential. Because guess what? Be real with you. These are the people you need to claim to. Because they're on the same journey you are. Come on. I'm going to tell you the best thing you can do. Listen, I don't, I, don't feel, I don't feel the press to pray for people tonight. But I do feel the press to do this. This is what I feel. I feel to leave you with wisdom. And this is the greatest wisdom for this. Find somebody... That is where you want to be. Come on. Find somebody that is where you want to be. And go to them. And ask them how they got there. Because wisdom is learned. Is gained by two ways. You can go through it. Or you can learn from somebody that's been through it. Amen. Why did I join the Ruach Global Network? Because when I look at Redemption to the Nations Church, I say, that's where I want to be. When I see the anointing that is on Bishop Wallace's life, I say, that's where I want to be. Come on. When I look at Apostle Jim Rayleigh's life and Apostle Ron Carpenter's life, and, and I'm going to name some y'all don't know, but i got to give them credit because this is where I got my knowledge from, a lot of it. When I look at Apostle, Apostle Brian Meadows, and I look at, uh, I, I look at Bishop, um, when I look at uh, Bishop Wallace, and when I look at um, Apostle Joshua Selman, and when I look at all these guys, say, y'all don't even know who these people are, but it's because I have spent my time finding people that are where I want to be, and I listen.
listen to everything that they have. I listen to every message I can get my hands on. I read every book that I can get my hands on. Come on, come on. Some of you, some of you don't even like John Maxwell, but that's okay because guess what? I've read three of his books, and one book I've read five times because he's got wisdom that I don't got, and I want to know everything that he knows so that I can gain the wisdom and the knowledge of what it takes to get there. Come on. Why do we read the Bible? Because we've all got one goal in mind. To make it to glory. And this is how we get there. We find people that's already made it like Peter, like Paul, like James, like John. Come on. Like all these people. And we read about what they did and what they said and how they lived. And we do our best to mimic it. So that we can reach the same place that they have reached. I thought, I, I'm going to use them again. I know he's getting tired of me. It's okay. I'll mess with somebody else Sunday. <laughs> I thought I knew a lot about football. I did. Randy be naming people I ain't never heard of. And telling me what year they played. And who they played for. And how many tackles they had. Come on. You know why? Because they have reached the place he wants to be. And he has studied it. He's seen the work that they put in. The effort that they put in. The time they spent on it. And he says, if I want to reach it, I've got to mimic it. You say, man, we copycat. And that's what Paul said to do. Paul said, find those that have authority over you, that are elders over you, and that have the anointing on their life that you desire and mimic their life. That's what he said. He said, copy them. Do what they did. Because guess what? If you want what they got, you've got to do what they do. Come on. That's why we have teachers. Man, I'm going. I'm, I've done got y'all standing up. My mom's done sat back down. <laughs> I'm going to pray one prayer. Everybody that wants potential unlocked in their life, just lift your hands. Matter of fact, lay one hand on your head. Lay one hand on your, on your heart. I wish you had three hands. Because I'd make you put one on your stomach. Everybody pat your heart. Say, God... The potential you put in here. Now start patting your head. Reveal it up here. Now put your hands out in the air. And say, now God, unleash it. Out there. Help me maximize my full potential for your glory, for your honor, and for the edification of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. Hey guys, I hope today's message has really encouraged you and has built your faith. Because our Bibles tell us that faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. And today, I believe that House of the Promise has planted that seed inside of you. The seed of faith. And I just want to take a moment at the end of this message today and pray with you that whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you've got going on in your life, God is going to intervene. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray right now and we ask that every situation and every circumstance for anyone that may be listening today, God, God, I pray that you would intervene in a mighty way like only you can, God. Your word says that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ever ask or thank God. So God, I just pray right now that healing would be loosed in their lives, salvation would be loosed in their lives, and your delivering power would be loosed in their lives, God. God, we thank you and we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that you got something out of that. I hope that God has spoken to your life today. I believe He has spoken to my life, and I believe that He is speaking into yours. So come back and be with us next time. Subscribe to the channel so that you never miss a word.
and be blessed.